By the power of Castle Hate Skull, I am Hella Mark Harley. And you are in for such a treat, I can't even begin to describe it. Your sweet tooth must be tingling in anticipation. So, I do have a cool episode for you guys today. We're going to do a couple new segments. Now that I've said it, I'm locked in, right? I can't just skip the new segments that I wanted to do last week and move them to today. We're actually doing them today. It's going to be incredible. So, if you listen to the fighter and the kid, you may already know this, but I'm going to use it as the first pivotal talking point in Supful, where I tell you, Sup Fools. So, fools and foolettes, today we're going to be talking about something that happened to me last night or the night before, or I forget when it was. It was recent, okay? The catalytic converter was stolen from my Prius. <gasps> Gasp. Oh, yes. I was on the way to work out with Brendan and Chappelle, and suddenly, I get in my car, start it up, and hear the loudest sound I've ever heard in my lifetime. The juxtaposition of me driving a Prius that sounds like a gang of Hell's Angels motorcyclists. I mean, the irony does not escape me. I... I'm so self-conscious driving it around. It's so, it's the loudest sound of all time. Fuck whoever took my goddamn catalytic converter. The worst part about this is that my mom was right. When I got the Prius, she was like, you have to go and get a cage for it because it, people are seeing it and it's an epidemic. And I'm like, yeah, 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 okay. Like, do you actually listen to your mom when she says crazy stuff like that? Like, oh yeah, okay, everybody's going around stealing catalytic converters. But apparently it's a real thing, apparently. There are roving gangs of catalytic converter thieves. I had no idea. Why? Because I don't take things like that seriously until they actually happen. So, Mom, Evelyn, you were right. I owe you an apology. I'm sorry. Let's move on, okay? Now, of course, things like that are extremely frustrating because uh, it's not even the money. It's the hassle of taking it in and knowing that you got got. And uh, the police even, <laughs> the funny part to me, I, I go to my car, hear it, hear this tremendous thundering sound, <clears throat> blot us out on planet Earth. And then I look to my windshield and see that the police have been here. Somebody saw it happen, called the cops, they show up and put a car. Now, I'm not blaming the cops. I am blaming the person who saw me get robbed of a catalytic converter and did nothing but call the police. Like, you saw it through your window. You shouldn't come out and be like, hey, that dude's, you know, at four in the morning, somebody's getting their car jacked up, and they're sawing off a uh, piece of uh, 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 metal equipment from the bottom of the car. Maybe intervene? I don't know. Did they look tough? I, yeah. <sighs> to quote the great movie Pulp Fiction, it would have been worth catching the motherfucker. Something like that. I'm paraphrasing. But, you know, when, <clears throat> when Vincent Vega gets his car keyed after having it in storage, he says it would have been worth getting keyed had he caught this motherfucker in the act of it. Sure. We'll find that clip. We'll find that clip and we'll bring it up. And you'll see how, you know, it's just, ugh, Pulp Fiction is just the gift that keeps on giving. You know, in times like these, I do feel it's important to put it into perspective uh, you know, sure, bad things happen to you. Your catalytic converter gets stolen in the middle of the night and you're driving the world's loudest Prius around Los Angeles until you get it fixed. But other people are experiencing other difficulties. And now I'm not saying <clears throat> that just because somebody else is suffering somewhere across the planet or somewhere else or even in your own house, that that should diminish your ability to take your problems seriously or to vent a little bit or whatever. You know, I think that's a bad thing in general to be like, oh, well, somebody else has it worse. Okay, so I guess that invalidates any suffering I've ever been through. That's not the case here. But it does help me sometimes to, to, to maybe focus on other people's issues that are probably bigger. And, and you could imagine swapping places with that person being, yeah, okay, I guess catalytic converter is not that bad. The first person that comes to mind is a guy named Chuck Eaton who wrote me this morning from his Instagram page, Underwater Ninja, WPB, Underwater underscore Ninja, underscore WPB. Now, I just wanted to th throw the first screenshot up there to show you that he had initially written me to say, uh, hit me up, I'll show you the best diving South Florida has to offer, just bring your own gear, and I got the rest. This was in response to a meme that said, uh, did you know, scuba divers roll backwards off boats because if they rolled forward, 
they would go into the boat. <laughs> so um, he graciously offered to help me scuba dive. This was uh, back in November. I thought that was cool. I love when people write me and say like, hey, hit me up. You know, we could do something if you're ever in this part of the country. I might just do that. So if you're in another part of the country or the world and you make these offers, don't think that I'm just like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because if you know me, you know that I will roll up on that ass and scuba dive. I just got to get the gear, I guess, or rent it or whatever. So a number of people have been reaching out to me after hearing the Fighter and the Kid episode in which I talked about my catalytic converter being stolen. Um, including Chuck, he reached out and said, um, or sorry, this wasn't in response to the catalytic converter. This was just him reaching out and saying something that made me want to shout his ass out. He said, yo, I got attacked by a customer's pit bull 10 days ago and haven't been able to work. So I got to catch up on haters will say, and some of your other stuff. It's been getting me through the days to my kids get home. Just wanted to say, thanks. I love the way you get people riled up. It's great. Keep up the good work. And I said, fuck man. Looks like you're getting a shout-out on the pod today. And that's what happened. You just witnessed him getting a shout-out. But, Chuck, I hope you're doing better. I hope you're healing up. I hope it wasn't too bad. But, goddamn, if you're attacked by a pit bull and that actually puts you out, I mean, I assume it actually was at least somewhat damaging, hit me up with more details. Because I want to know, and I think if you're listening to this, the people want to know what happened, and they want to know the progress on your recovery. Okay. And another one that somebody hit me up with, and... I'll just preface this by saying people do hit me up a lot like and I posted something to my story the other day where, uh, you know, like people because 50 Cent follows me because I did uh, the 50 Central show on BET in 2017. People will see that he follows me and not even do any research on like who I am. They're just like, hey, 50 Cent follows you. Give me give this mixtape to him. And I'm like, go fuck yourself. Uh, You know, at first I might have been more polite or just ignore it. But like. Now I feel obligated to like teach people a lesson about how to conduct themselves online because it's just the worst way to go about things. Demanding in a rude fashion that somebody does a favor for you and that favor in question wouldn't even lead to them being successful anyway. It's like maybe if, if you know, me doing that thing for you would actually benefit you in some way, but like me writing 50 Cent or posting your song to my story, that's just not the way you want to go about Uh, promoting yourself as an artist if you have 15 followers on Bandcamp or what is it what's the place called what's the online um SoundCloud that's what it is yeah Bandcamp what is this 2009 um so it's just a lesson in general nobody can do anything for you if you're not doing those things for yourself if you're trying to build a music career DMing strangers, hoping that, you know, <laughs> what, I'm going to post your story and it's going to go viral. He also said, this guy, I mean, I should be having screenshots here. He said, hey, send this, uh, <laughs> post this to your story, post my song to your story, um, and write me a workout plan. <laughs> like, oh, we're making demands now? Like, um, but anyway, so I'm, I'm saying all that because <clears throat> that's what I'm used to as far as people asking me for things that just irritate me because it's like, no, first of all, you're being super rude and this wouldn't help you anyway. Rarely does somebody actually message me and I feel like I can do something about it. A guy named, I'm going to butcher his name, the uh, Instagram handle, I got to give it up for this, is Official Waffle, spelled just like it sounds, Official Waffle, no spaces, congratulations on landing yourself, that Instagram handle, Yafer Zapata. I know Zapata, Zapata, shoe in Spanish. I just don't know how to say Yaffer. Is it Yaffer? Is it Yaffer? I don't know. Regardless, he hit me up last night and said, hey, Mark, any way you can help shout out my brother's GoFundMe. His house was burned down by a homeless man who started a brush fire between his backyard and the 10 freeway. And he links to, this, uh, to the GoFundMe there. The title of it is Help the Zapata Leone Family Rebuild Their Home, organized by Jennifer something something. Okay. He was a repeat offender who police would never do anything about. They had been called multiple times. My brother had put out smaller fires that he had started. This is crazy to me. I was just like, damn, dude, this dude's out here starting fires? And like, you're calling the cops on him? And they're like, yeah, then we can do. Like, the dude's an arsonist. But like, it makes me wonder, is he specifically being targeted? That's kind of what it sounds like, but goddamn. So this one was way too out of control, and they lost everything. And we see some pictures down here of the house burning down. This just really plucked my heartstrings and made me think again, putting things in perspective. Yeah. You know, a $500 catalytic converter, 
not that bad compared to not just the physical damages of the house, but all the things that are probably burned in there that you're never going to be able to get back. And because it's not like, uh, you know, you're in a Malibu fire and sure that's terrible too, but like, like even if you had an hour or a few hours to collect your things, to collect your valuables, your irreplaceables and get out, I assume this was much more of a surprise since it was being set by a random homeless arsonist. So I'm going to link here. If you Google uh, or search on GoFundMe, help the Zapata Leone family rebuild their home. I'm going to post that to my story also, but that's going to happen today. Um, their goal is 10000 bucks, 4575 Race at the time of the recording of this podcast. I urge you to help out. I think it'd be cool. And I'm just going to read this part. Hi, my name is Yaffer. And as many of you guys know, Monday, January 10th, my brother's home was burned down by a vagrant who started a brush fire between my brother's home and the 10 freeway. Because of this, my brother, his wife, and two kids have no place to call home. It's really tough for us to ask in these hard times. But if anyone has anything they would like to contribute, it would be highly appreciated. Thanks for all your help. I'm going to contribute after we record this podcast. I would do it on here and prove to you all that I'm going to do it, but like it would just take too long. I think it'd be boring. Okay. That's pretty much all I wanted to say as far as subpool because it's just a reminder to put things in perspective and have gratitude. I'm big on gratitude because I think so many people lack it and I think it's such a cornerstone to unhappiness in life. If you can't be grateful for the things that you have, if you aren't grateful for having basic things like food and shelter and family and a place to rest your head at night that isn't burnt to a crisp, um, you know, maybe you're going to act entitled. And be very unhappy when you don't get more and more of these things that you, in your head, have convinced yourself that you somehow deserve. So I always try to practice gratitude for the basics, you know. And people will rip on my 2006 Toyota Prius. But you know what? I'm grateful for it, right? At least I have a car. I I could drive the car. It's super noisy. Christian heard it this morning. It sounds like garbage. But at least I have a car to get me from point A to point B. And I'm happy about that. You know, I think uh, having a Ferrari is cool, Brendan, but do I need that to be happy? And again, Brendan's not making fun of me for having a Prius. Um, people online will be like, oh my God, I can't believe you drove a Prius, that's crazy. It's like, yeah, dude, because I'm not a millionaire. So when I am, maybe I'll grab a Ferrari or something cool like that. But for now, I'm just super happy to be able to get from point A to point B without paying for an Uber. So... Speaking of personal happiness and things of that nature, one of the new segments that I wanted to do today is called Hella Psychedelic. I don't know if you know, but I am a big advocate of psychedelic use for both recreational and therapeutic purposes. Now, this is something that I would like to kind of throw out there and go, hey, maybe nobody who watches this show has any interest whatsoever, but maybe you do. So I wanted to use this segment Uh, as a segue into talking about some of the other things that I'm interested in in life that I have experience with that maybe you do too and that also tangentially relate to fitness because as far as what I think of fitness, it's about more than just the sets and the reps and the programming and the dieting and all those things are great. But I will repeat this basic idea over and over again till I'm blue in the face is that It's about well-being for me. And I noticed that if I miss a day or two of working out, the first thing that comes to mind is, man, I'm on edge. Or, uh, you know, my sense of well-being, my sense of calm is not quite what it is when I'm doing exhausting workouts multiple times a week. So I have always seen it as something that gets me this effect of having a nice body, Uh, It has this effect of giving me self-confidence because of looking a certain way and even being a certain strength level. However, the most important thing is always this foundational element of well-being as far as my mental health. So, turns out psychedelic usage also has some relationship to mental well-being. I'm a big fan of Dr. Rhonda Patrick, if you follow Joe Rogan, you may know about her and her work. Uh, She always seems to be on the forefront of um, the latest scientific studies on things that improve performance, uh, brain function. Um, You know, for example, during uh, this pandemic, 
she has been talking about all the things you can do to stave off illness or reduce the severity of the illness, like super dosing vitamin D, for example. So she's always somebody that I tune into to kind of get my pulse on, get my finger on the pulse of what's happening on the forefront of health and fitness and well being. And she's just, you know, a really articulate and interesting person. So I was watching this video about psychedelic mushrooms, AKA psilocybin. And I guess I'll just start off by kind of summarizing what I found in the video. She's talking about how basically um, getting a therapy with a few doses of, uh, micro doses of psilocybin mushrooms can mimic the effects of SSRIs. And SSRIs are antidepressant selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, um, which help to, I suppose, flood your brain with serotonin. That's my understanding of how they work. Uh, they, they prevent serotonin from leaving your brain, right? Um, <clears throat> and therefore create a flood of that neurochemical that creates a sense of calm and well-being. So, of course, there's a lot of side effects to SSRIs. If you've taken them or known somebody who has, people gain weight on them. People experience a loss of libido and ability to achieve an erection or an orgasm. Doesn't sound fun, right? So even if I was feeling like I was depressed, um, you know, SSRIs wouldn't necessarily be something that I'd consider right off the bat unless I was in a really, really bad extreme case because, you know, <laughs> I think getting fatter and not being able to come would make me more depressed. So if... You know, microdosing mushrooms can achieve that same result. Pretty cool, right? Pretty uh, interesting as far as something that's worth studying in the future. And that does seem to be taking place more and more. Scientists are studying psychedelic mushrooms uh, in a more serious context because obviously they were, they first started studying them in the 1950s, I believe, and then they were banned. And now things are just opening up again where they can do more scientific rigorous studies on the effects that they actually have. She goes on to talk about a study in mice that they use that <clears throat> show that just a couple doses of psilocybin mushrooms um, reduced anxiety, reduced depression, seem to uh, increase the density of the dendritic spines of these mice, uh, these, these mouse's neurons, right? And that seems to be the sort of actual mechanism by which uh, the depression and anxiety are relieved. Because if you're experiencing a lot of repeated acute stress in your life, uh, the density of the dendritic spines <clears throat> in your neurons will go down. There's less activity amongst the neurons and psilocybin turns out can sort of uh, ramp that up again. So it's still, I think somewhat of a mystery. It's still like just something that's posited. This may be the mechanism that works on humans, but when you give uh, psilocybin to humans, it seems that just, uh, you know, a, a few doses in conjunction with therapy can have these lasting effects. So I think they measured them up to like six months and see if people had, you know, relapse into anxiety or depression. And uh, turns out there wasn't any indication that people, even after taking this, it's not like, oh, you, you know, I have to be on mushrooms in order to not be depressed. It turns out that doing the therapy uh, and taking the psilocybin had this effect that was long lasting. And even after six months, people still hadn't relapsed. So I'll say that it's just, you know, it's a video that I watched. I thought was interesting, but as far as my own experience in that, I have become a, an evangelist for psychedelics because I think many people are, if not misinformed, I guess they have, in a sense they're misinformed, but they have terrible connotations with things like mushrooms and LSD, right? They sort of consider it to be a, a big scary thing that's like a hard drug and um, don't often wrap their mind around the fact that you can take something and have a proportional response to it. Sort of like, I'll use this analogy that I use with steroids and drinking, where, you know, if TRT is a shot of alcohol, then what bodybuilders do is like, you know, take 30 shots a day. Similarly, with psilocybin mushrooms or LSD, if you take a microdose versus a, uh, you know, a very high dose that's going to cause you hallucinations and you're using it for recreational purposes. Like you take, you know, 
a quarter ounce of mushrooms or you take four tabs equaling 400 micrograms of LSD, those are going to be the liftoff dose to have you experience full-on visuals and ego death and all these various things that you associate that, and also risk the potential for a bad trip if you're not in a positive mind space. But at a lower level, you are <clears throat> only really enhancing your mood. So I've taken those high doses of psilocybin. I've taken those high doses of LSD and had fantastic times, frankly. But on a lower dose, you know, let's say 25 micrograms of LSD, and I would consider uh, 100 or 120 micrograms of LSD to be the sort of liftoff point where you start to feel like you're having a trip. It's the very beginning, but uh, you know, you can certainly proportionally increase that dose upwards and experience more visuals and more melting of the ego. But I've likened it to this. It sort of feels like taking coffee and having the giggles. It's a mood enhancer. And it's interesting to also look at, if you look at like the serotonin molecule next to an LSD or a psilocybin, um, or maybe even DMT, I remember they, they all sort of looked similar. And I'm not a chemist, I couldn't tell you like exactly what the difference is between that. But my sense is having taken these various um, substances that it is serotonergic in some way, if I'm using that correctly. It's, it's a serotonin-based high. You feel like your sense of well-being is enhanced. It's the only thing that I've ever taken on microdose LSD and worked out before. For example, now, I'm not somebody who would ever drink before a workout. I'm somebody who would never smoke weed before a workout. I've tried all these things before. Um, you know, I think anybody who's like, you know, <laughs> I couldn't tell you the exact time that I actually drank and did a workout, but um, I know that if I if I drank and I have to like run somewhere, it's uncomfortable. If I've drank and ever had to lift something heavy, it's uncomfortable. I don't like it. I would never consider that a performance enhancer or something that would make the workout easier. Even though a lot of people like, I've seen Arnold Schwarzenegger smoke weed and like, oh yeah, you got to lift high. And I'm like, I don't know. I think he was just like smoking after he worked out, but people will swear by it. I've never smoked weed and felt like motivated to hit a PR personally. It could be nice to maybe smoke weed and go for a long run, but it just isn't for me. LSD was the only thing that I felt like this didn't interfere. It actually kind of made it more fun. Now you get really hot, your core temperature will increase. So you want to be in a gym with good ventilation and plenty of water. But I'll just say I put it in a different classification from some of these other substances um, it, because they're non-addictive. There's no hangover, even at higher doses that I've experienced. And I think they can often generate real insight, especially when it comes to processing things like death. Um, loss of loved ones, loss of pets, et cetera. Um, if you're really stressed out, I wouldn't do it because I think that those kind of mental states are not great for psychedelics and you can end up stressing yourself out even more and feeling really panicky and chaotic. But you know, if you're at a turning point in your life and need to reflect on things and perhaps, um, you know, in this case, in the video they, that I was watching, they mentioned... Um, <clears throat> terminally ill patients. So psilocybin has the potential to reduce anxiety in terminally ill patients because you become less scared of death. You understand your place in the cycle of life and have profound realizations uh, that allow you to reduce your fear about dying. And that's pretty insane, isn't it? So what I'm saying is take LSD this weekend and tell me how it goes, all right? If you like what I'm saying right now, and you want to hear more about psychedelics and want to investigate this in the future more, comment below. And if you want to tell me about your psychedelic experiences, where maybe you've uh, you know, processed some really deep, dark things on your own or had interesting insights while on psychedelics, I want you to put both your positive and negative experiences in the comments below. Thank you so much. Boy, oh boy, I've been sitting on this one for a while. The next portion of the podcast is the hella personality portion of the podcast. So if you know me in real life and you get me going on the Myers-Briggs personality type indicator, you know that I won't shut the F up about it because it's something that I've become obsessed with in the last, let's say, decade because it helps me understand the world. It helps me empathize with other people who aren't like me. And when I was younger, I would get frustrated with people who weren't like me. You'd say, oh my God, why can't they see my point? Why can't this person understand the way that I approach things. Why is this person so into following rules? Don't they get that you can do this and that differently? I butt heads with a lot of people, especially I bring that example up of people who 
follow rules because I'm not necessarily a rule follower. I appreciate rules that they exist, but I'm also somebody who believes that they can be broken. Maybe you're like that. Maybe you're not. <clears throat> um, I would like to get into this because it's also something that to me relates back to fitness and mental health because when I'm communicating with different people about fitness or thinking about <clears throat> when people come to me and ask me to say, oh, can you make me a diet? Can you make me a plan? Can you do this and that? You have to look at that person as an individual. Not everything is going to work with every person and I need to know some things about any individual to figure out what level, for example, of organization that they prefer in their life to actually execute uh, their diet and exercise plans. If you like to be super regimented and write everything out uh, and track all of your calories and eat the same thing every day, you might be in this category and you also might be somebody on the other side of the spectrum who enjoys having more of a loose, informal structure, improvising in the gym, not doing the same thing, eating a different thing every day because you're going to get sick of it. And so that's going to help you get the best results. We all have different personality archetypes. And I was first introduced to this from a friend who actually turned out to be my same personality type. Uh, but it's a quick quiz that I'm going to challenge everybody here to go take at 16personalities.com. Like the letter... One six, or sorry, the number one six, and then personalities.com. Now, what I have here is a brief introduction to who I am. I'm going to start doing some interviews, some long form interviews uh, in the next few weeks, ideally, with some fitness influencers um, that I, as part of these long form interviews, I want to have them take the test and come on and tell me about that and, and have me kind of cold read some of their preferences. It's also a fun party trick for me to guess people's personality types before they tell me, before uh, they share the results with their test of, with me. Because I like to think you can kind of take, you know, three or four uh, questions. If you get people to answer honestly, there is the possibility that you can predict somebody's personality type based on limited information and then tell them much more about themselves than they were aware that you knew. I'm going to start with myself. I am an ENTP. That stands for extroverted, intuitive, thinking, and perceiving. The binary on all these four are you're either an extrovert or an introvert. And of course, this is a sliding scale. Nobody's 100% extroverted or 100% introverted. So you might be finding yourself saying, I'm not like anything. I'm a total individual. I'm not an extrovert or an introvert. Sometimes an extrovert, sometimes an introvert. Which is true. You could be. But for the purposes of this test, you got to do one. So... I'm more extroverted than I am introverted, even though I do like spending lots of time alone. Ultimately, I get my energy from social situations. Um, and extroversion, introversion is also another interesting topic that doesn't just have to do with sort of shyness or social skills or, you know, a desire to be the center of attention. It's more complicated than that. And it's how you define yourself uh, to the world versus how you define the world according to your own values. So there's extroversion, introversion. Sensing or intuition, which sort of means sensing people like more concrete information, intuitive people like to take in information in a more abstract way. Uh, thinking versus feeling, the basic idea there is sort of a reliance on uh, emotion versus rationality. That's an oversimplification, but it tends to work that way. Uh, most women are Fs, most men are Ts, but there's certainly plenty of male Fs and plenty of female Ts. It's probably about 70-30 is my guess. Then the P versus the J is perceiving versus judging. Judging people in general tend to be more organized. That doesn't necessarily mean your physical space at home is more organized. It just means that um, your thoughts in general and your ability to be decisive are probably enhanced versus somebody who's a P or a perceiver. Uh, a perceiver is more likely to be somebody who procrastinates, <laughs> pre procrastination, but that's because they want to gather more information. They want to perfect things. So you, maybe a perfectionist is more likely to be a P because you want to take the extra time not to get it done, but oh, I'm going to tweak it a little bit and get it better or, or look for that gray area. They're less decisive because they're more interested in sort of the in-between and the gray area and seeing nuance. So both these things can come in handy at different times, but often in relationships, we see that opposites do attract. You know, if you're a P, maybe getting with another P in a marriage, for example, could lead to uh, too much disorganization. So those types of polarities often work, but perhaps not with every single letter. So I'll read about myself a little bit. 
because ENTPs are, of course, self-absorbed. A debater, or the ENTP, is a person with the extroverted intuitive thinking and prospecting personality traits. They tend to be bold and creative, deconstructing and rebuilding ideas with great mental agility. They pursue their goals vigorously despite any resistance they might encounter. No one loves the process of mental sparring more than the debater personality type as it gives them a chance to exercise their effortlessly quick wit. I know it sounds like I'm blowing myself here, but this is just what it says and it'll say nice things about your personality type too. Broad accumulated knowledge base and capacity for connecting disparate ideas to prove their points. Debaters are the ultimate devil's advocate, thriving on the process of shredding arguments and beliefs and letting the ribbons drift in the wind for all to see. They don't always do this because they're trying to achieve some deeper purpose or strategic goal, though. Sometimes it's for the simple reason that it's fun. An odd juxtaposition arises with debaters as they are uncompromisingly honest but will argue tirelessly for something that they don't actually believe in, stepping into another's shoes to argue a truth from another perspective. Playing the devil's advocate helps people with the debater personality type to not only develop a better sense of others' reasoning, but a better sense of opposing ideas, since debaters are the ones arguing them. The tactics shouldn't be confused with the sort of mutual understanding diplomat personality seek. Debaters, like all analyst personality types, and that's another thing too, the NT subgroup, so ENTJs, INTJs, ENTPs, INTPs, that's one-fourth of the personality type that makes up the analyst subsection. Like all analyst personality types are on a constant quest for knowledge. And what better way to gain knowledge than to attack and defend an idea from every angle, from every side? Breaking the rules, follow the path of the unsafe, independent thinker, expose your ideas to the dangers of controversy, speak your mind and fear less the label of crackpot than the stigma of conformity. That is true, I do fear conformity. And on issues that seem important to you, stand up and be counted at any cost. So I would say that sums me up pretty accurately as far as my desire to see things from all sides, my distrust of anybody presenting something dogmatically, um, Something that irritates people about me is that I will pursue a devil's advocate position and say, well, have you considered this? And they might take it personally because they think I'm disagreeing with them or even that you know, if I do disagree with them, I tend to take these things less personally um, than somebody who perhaps has their identity more wrapped up in their belief system um, or just other personality types in general who aren't as comfortable with the idea that debate and going back and forth and disagreeing can be a sort of separate abstract thing that, you know, isn't who you are. I am not my beliefs. I am not my positions on any issue. And I enjoy talking with people who also take that same approach and we can have disagreements and argue the best side of each point and then let it go afterwards and go on eating our Arby sandwiches. <clears throat> so I'm going to encourage you guys if that sounds cool to you, because everybody wants to know about themselves, right? Deep down, we are all self-absorbed, just like Mark Harley. Deep down, we all want to know what personality type we have. So I want you to go to 16personalities.com, take the quiz. It's really short. And then put your personality type in the comments. And if you want, I'll read some of these out next week. If it's something that interests you, if finding out more about your personality archetype is something that you might be interested in learning about, and learning about other people's personality types too, I want to do it with you. Oh, you know what we got today? We got another hater of the week. Today, we're going to start off with a hater of the week runner up from Hunter Hudson. This person doesn't even follow me, and yet she's messaging me with a picture from PBS Kids that says, Val Power, five fun episodes that will get kids reading. And there's what looks like an elderly lion in the picture. Ha, 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 Hunter. Oh, you're so funny, I forgot to laugh. The thing is, it hurts because it's accurate, okay? And so I'm gonna give you that, Hunter. I'm gonna give you the fact that you saw this and you thought of me, even though you don't follow me, you slid into my DM request and said, oh, this looks like you. I know. <sighs> your, your, your hater of the week runner up, Hunter because it's accurate. And I'm just looking at this going, God damn, that guy could be my dad. <clears throat> the real hate of the week, you know, a lot of people talk shit to me online throughout the week, 
But the real hater of the week this week is a guy, because it's so rare that you actually get somebody admitting that they hate you, right? Who you don't even know. So, <laughs> uh, you know, classic, in classic internet troll fashion, a no avatar, no follower, no post private account posts on my latest picture of me, Brendan, and Chappelle in the Fight on the Kids studio. I hate you all. Useless waste of space. And I said, triggered little baby, because honestly, you have to be triggered in order to come to my page and say, I hate all of you. Let's just break that down for a second. I don't know you. I've never done anything to you. I don't know who you are. You only see me online, and yet you actually have hate for me? Like, that's a sentence you're actually willing to type out and post and think that it makes me look bad and think that it's going to hurt my feelings? Your feelings are already hurt. I've done something to you. I've offended you in some way, unknowingly, probably by just existing. Who would have thunk it? But again, because this is for people who, uh, you know, <laughs> even when 900 people are, you know, rating my Spotify podcast to one and then also coming back to my page and saying, you don't have any haters, uh, which is something that actually happens. People say, you don't have any haters. <clears throat> and then we'll go on, uh, you know, uh, <laughs> mass coordinated campaigns to downvote my podcast rating. Oh no, my Spotify rating. What shall I ever do? And then turn around and tell me they don't have any haters. Now, I'm not saying this guy is the biggest, most prolific hater all the time, but he actually used the word hate. I remember when I was a kid and I, uh, I used the word hate, like I hate oranges or something. You know, I don't, I don't hate oranges, but I said something and a teacher corrected me. He was like, you know, every time you use the word hate, it comes back on you tenfold. Like he had some like pre-memorized speech. I was like, okay, yeah, great job. Like, you know, Mr. Stewart, whatever your name is, giving me some rehearsed speech about hate. But I wasn't ready for the message at that point. But later in life, I realized how much energy it is to hate people and how entitled and childish it makes you seem. If you're going around uh, saying, I hate this and I hate that, just as a matter of speech, right? You're going to realize that that person, you know, if, if you just showed me how somebody speaks like it was written out and they're saying like, I hate this. I hate pepperoni pizza. I hate going to school. I hate your stupid computer. You sound 12, right? So it, it's number one, it's indicative of an immaturity that either you're very young or you speak like somebody who's very young and entitled. But secondly, just the energy that you must spend Letting somebody who I don't even know what you look like and I'm taking up space in your brain rent free enough to the point that you sought out my page. You don't follow me, right? So you, you typed in hello, Mark Harley in your feed and typed out, I hate all of you. What did we do to you? Nothing. And yet here you are having negative emotions about somebody you've never even met. Sounds like a waste of time, doesn't it? Sounds like a pretty unproductive use of that little brain you got in there doesn't it? So I'm going to encourage you, Pouch Fanny, to grow the fuck up. A lot of people have been asking me some pretty cool stuff. A lot of people have been asking me, Mark, what kind of food do you eat? I know I do these hella Chef Harleys and I tell you all the cool, amazing things that I eat on a weekly basis, but let's just talk nuts and bolts real quick. What are your macro breakdowns right now? Well, after getting a little fat over the holidays, I am going to go on a diet. I'm going to be eating 2,640 calories Monday through Friday, followed by a 36-hour fast and a weekly refeed of 3,250 calories. So this is just me, but use it as a template perhaps. And I can run through how you might use this as a template. Monday through Friday, I'm consuming 320 grams of protein, 160 grams of carbs, and 80 grams of fat. So roughly, that works out to about 50% of my calories coming from protein. And then I take the rest and split. I think it's actually like 23% carbs and maybe 27% fat. But the template that I'm using there is finding a total uh, caloric intake per day that will put me in a deficit. And uh, 26, 2700 calories is a... Uh, number of calories that I've used in the past at roughly my weight, um, you know, 240 to 250, that will allow me to be in a solid deficit, but not 
make me hungry to the point where I'm going to break the diet just out of hunger. You know, I may make some other bad choices that I can make up for later. Again, we talk about weekly caloric totals being the ultimate goal to allow for some flexibility and allow for the fact that you're not always going to be perfect and you can make up for it later. But if I'm eating about 26 to 2,700 calories a day and lifting weights and doing cardio a few times a week, like today, hitting my, uh, <laughs> did some 15 minutes of Stairmaster uh, as Christian lifted weights like a fucking savage. But get in a little cardio, you know, get in some weightlifting, 2,700 calories, 2,600 calories. For me, it's going to put me in a deficit. I start with 50% of my calories from protein, and then I split the rest between carbs and fat. And that's a balance that you can come up with. But if you eat half your calories from protein in a deficit, I guarantee you, you're going to get lean over time. So that's one thing you may want to look into. Go to caloriecalculator.net. They still haven't sponsored me, but they should. Go there, put it in there, see what kind of deficit you want. You want to be losing a pound a day? Great. You want to be losing a pound a week? Great. You want to be losing a half a pound a month? Whatever floats your boat, bro. <clears throat> For me, you know, I, I can create a deficit of one to two pounds a week with this uh, caloric total. And 80 grams of fat is enough that it's satiating. 160 grams of carbs is enough that uh, it's going to fuel my performance without having excessive carbohydrates. Then I'm going to fast for 36 hours. Oh my God. It's doable. It's not, I'm not going to say fun, but it's interesting. Fasting for 36 hours is interesting. So you have that meal on Friday night at 6 p.m. for me, and then you don't eat again until Sunday morning. Um, you'll notice some interesting things happen. You'll actually notice your energy levels increase. Oh my goodness. Uh, you'll empty out that stomach. You know, aesthetically, you kind of, you want to get like a smaller looking stomach that's not distended. Try not eating. Duh. Uh, your sense of smell gets heightened. You will really enjoy and savor that food and also conquer that mental barrier that you have that says, I need to eat. Oh my God, I'm so hungry. I'm going to die. But you're not, you're not going to die. Are you? Then the refeed, 250 grams of protein, 450 grams of carbs. So we bump those carbs up a little bit. And because your insulin is going to be spiking because of those carbohydrates, we don't want to shuttle a bunch of fat into our bloodstream, do we? So we drop the fat down to 50. It's a basic template. Use it if you want. Use that 50% uh, protein. If you want to get lean, it's hard to do, but you can do it. And I guarantee you, you're going to have results. Isn't that high protein? Yes, it is. Are you going to die? No. What do you think is safer? The high protein or all the steroids I take? Huh? You do the math. On today's Hello Chef Harley, we have another absolute banger of a diet suggestion for you. Something very complicated. So complicated, it actually requires no preparation. So this has been something over the past couple of years that I've used in my diet on a near daily basis. And I just, even if I don't eat one of these in the day, it's a nice go-to kind of like those premier protein shakes, it's something that I like to have on hand. This is cottage cheese and pineapple combined in one cup. <laughs> Who would have thunk it, right? Now, I'm not a huge fan of cottage cheese. It's a great slow-burning protein that a lot of people recommend you eat at night, for example, uh, before you go to bed because it it's, has uh, more casein protein, which breaks down slower than whey protein, for example. It's very high-quality protein. Um, so if you eat dairy, you know, cottage cheese is a great option. Now, Cottage cheese is fine. I just, it's something that I kind of have to choke down, right? The, I'm not super into the consistency or the flavor. It's not great. It's just sort of bland, right? Um, so a lot of people will dress it. Look, I've even had people, like somebody introduced me to putting uh, cottage cheese on a potato recently. I thought that was really good. But usually you want to eat it in conjunction with something just for the taste element of it. I found that adding just this little bit of pineapple makes it super palatable. Like I could sit down and eat two of these. It tastes great. Um, it just really elevates it for the fact that it's only... Um, you know, one serving of this, which is a fourth of the cup, I eat the whole thing, but a serving of it's 110 calories with eight grams of protein and 14 grams of carbs. Um, so if you eat the whole thing, it's 440 grams or it's 440 calories and 36 grams of protein. Now, I'll be honest with you, the, this is the Knudsen one. The generic one that I get for Ralph's has different nutrition facts. I don't know if that's accurate or not, or if it's just a testament to the fact that, um, you know, <laughs> like people don't give a shit what they put on a nutrition label and it could be totally inaccurate. I don't know. But 
the one that I usually get is that they were out of is the Kroger brand and the calories are 90 per serving and it has 44 grams of protein total. So unless they're fudging the numbers, maybe they put a little bit more protein, a little less cottage cheese in here, which could be the case because that would make it cheaper and more profitable for Knudsen. Fucking corporations, right? Big, big cottage cheese is taking advantage of you right now. Um, but normally I'll have one of those ones from Kroger and it's just a great snack that, you know, if the Kroger one is accurate, then it's, uh, 360 calories and 44 grams of protein and it's delicious and it doesn't fill you up or make you bloated or anything like that. So if you're at Ralph's, for example, check it out and shove some goddamn cottage cheese and pineapple in your face. Would you let me know how it is. And finally, we got a, this is why we can't have nice gems. Now, somebody, I forget who said this to me. If you said this to me. I'm going to shout you out on the next podcast, but this is something I see. I saw this at the gym yesterday and just didn't have my phone because I normally put my phone away in my locker so that I can focus fully on the workout at hand because I'm a fucking savage. But this dude right here is doing the thing where they get in the cable crossovers, right? And they, they lunge forward and use all their body momentum to, to press the cables forward like this, like, like they're doing some sort of like... Um, like superhero move, like they're landing and like, oh, oh, but they're doing nothing. You are doing nothing for your pectorals. And again, I'm going to continue to point out this pattern that notice the physiques of the people who lift like this. They're not good. This guy doesn't have huge pecs, but he's taking up a lot of space and using a lot of movement to do something that has virtually no stress on his actual pecs because he's using all momentum and all leg drive to get his hands to that finished position where his, he's locked out in front of him. I saw this. I, I, there's a guy, a young guy, like this guy's older. So you kind of like give him a little bit of a, you know, you spot him. Like, all right, you're, you're, you're 60 years old with a ponytail. I get it. Um, you're also, you know, working out with gloves. I get it. <clears throat> but there's a guy who's like 20 years old. I see him doing that week after week, using all the momentum in the world on these cable crossovers. And I'm just, I'm so tempted to go up to him and be like, hey, hey so what, what, what muscle are you doing there, huh? What muscle are you working on with those, uh, you know, full body, leap in the air, come back down, cable crossovers? Uh, the answer is zero. You're doing, you're working zero muscles. You got zero reps. You get a zero for the day. No stamp for you. Go home. On a similar note, yes, this guy looks like me if he was shorter and fatter and 50 years old. Using momentum. He's trying to lift the whole stack on tricep press downs. And here's my thing. Now, he is working his triceps a little bit. But he, if you have to jump in to the rep each time, don't you think you'd be better served by something else? If your ambition is to lock out your triceps with the heaviest weight possible, why not do a close grip bench press or a reverse grip bench press or something of that nature that allows the stress on your triceps to be elevated safely by the movement? Is this guy going to hurt himself? No. But I just want to know with these guys, it's like, so you, you went in there, was it like, you, did you walk in and decide you were going to do the whole stack and then work backwards from there? And say, like, whatever form I have to use to get the whole stack, that's the only way I'm going to get a workout, you know? I just want to interview these. Maybe that should be my next series. Interviewing these guys at the gym and go, ah, you know, how, how old were you when you first started lifting like shit? How old were you when you first were hit by a car and decided that this was good tricep press down form? So, if this is you, if you see yourself on this podcast, please... I'm going to give you a free personal training session, okay? If your form is so fucked up that other people are videoing you and sending it to me, you need help and I want to give it to you, okay? So if you see yourself on this podcast, please write me on Instagram at Hella Mark Harley and I will fly you out and do a personal training session with you. But it has to be real. You can't just go out there and fake it and say, oh my God, look how fucked up my form is. Mark, fly me out. But if this is you, fat, short, old guy with a low ponytail doing tricep press downs that involve a jump every rep, I want to see you in person and I'm going to teach that ass how to do a proper tricep press down and we're going to blow those triceps up. Okay, bad boy. Wow. Thank you for making it all the way through that psychedelic journey of an episode with me. Remember, I want to see your personality type in the comments. 
I want to see your experiences with psychedelic substances in the comment or somebody you know who isn't you for sure. Write it down in the comments. Rate the podcast on Spotify. Rate the podcast on Apple Podcasts. Leave a review if you can. Let's see who's going to win, huh? My fans or my haters? And maybe, you know, maybe the haters are going to actually have to admit that they exist, right? Because it's uh, almost a 1,000 ratings on Spotify. Can we bump it up? Can we get to 2,000 ratings with some people who actually like the podcast, who have actually listened to it rather than pretended to listen to it? Doesn't matter to me a lot either way. I just kind of want to have this race and this competition to see if you're out there listening. Do you care enough to leave a rating on Spotify? Do you care enough to leave a rating on Apple Podcasts? It's neck and neck right now. The fans and the haters. Who's going to win? The light or the dark? The good or the evil? Is Mark going to keep wearing raw gear tank tops every goddamn week? Is he going to take them off at the end? I don't know. It doesn't really matter to me, but if you want to see it, I'm going to deliver it every single time. Let me know in the comments. Am I too buff? Should I start shrinking down? Mom, were you really right? Did you send me some money for the catalytic converter? 